Okay. All right. Oops. So hello, I'm Brianna Pobiner. Um, it's nice to almost meet everybody, at least virtually. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Like I said, this will be our last technical hurdle, and hopefully this will work just fine. Um, actually, first, I'm going to start a slideshow. And then there we go. I'm going to share that. And so you can let me know if you're seeing my slides. It looks like that's working. Um, Looks like you guys are on mute, but if you ha if if it's not working, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just gonna go we can see with it. it. Excellent. Okay, so it's nice to meet everybody. I'm Brianna Pobiner. I work at the Smithsonian at the National Museum of Natural History, and um, I'm an archaeologist, also sort of a paleontologist because I study fossils. But I'm just going to start with telling you a little bit about what I do, telling you about some of my current research projects, and then I'm happy to open things up for questions about um, what it's like to, to be a scientist and be doing this kind of research um, that way. So I want to start with saying that if um, you're in the room and think, I don't think uh, science is for me. It's not really my thing. I was exactly where you were actually all the way up until I got to college. So I had awesome science teachers when I was in middle and high school. Um, but I, the way that I learned science was very much, it was about memorizing things. It was about doing a lab and getting the right answer. Or maybe if you got the wrong answer, you didn't do the lab right. Um, and then I got to college. And um, I had an advisor who was helping me choose classes for my first semester. And she suggested that I take a class in a field called anthropology. And I had no idea what anthropology was, um, but she told me that it was the study of people. And I thought that sounded pretty cool. Um, and then I had a course with the professor who would become my main advisor. Um, and it was the first time that it, that any kind of science was taught to me, that it was about things that we're still um, trying to figure out, questions that were unknown, mysteries to solve, things that I might be able to actually participate in. So I got really excited about all these unknown things in science. Um, and that's really what got me hooked in anthropology. After my third year of college, um, I well, during my third year of college, I did a study abroad program in London. And that's where I found out about a field school in South Africa. So one of the things that archaeologists or paleontologists often do is spend a summer getting kind of training in how to do field work. Um, so I had this amazing field school in South Africa. And by the end of it, I realized that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be what's called a paleoanthropologist. So I study like the lives of fossil people. Um, and so I remember asking the field school director at the end of it, okay, this is great. What, what should I do next? And he said, well, probably graduate school, but also just keep asking people who you meet for any kind of like internship or research opportunities. And so that's what I did. Um, I should mention that that field school was the first time I spent any kind of time, like extended time camping in a tent, learning how to set up a tent. Um, I love the outdoors, but I didn't really have a lot of opportunities to spend a lot of time doing stuff like that when I was growing up. Um, and you can see this fossil animal skeleton here. It was also where I really started to get interested in what fossil animal bones can tell us about the past. Um, and the two main things they can tell us about the past are, um, the first is what I study is what people ate, and then also what the environment was like, what animals and plants were around. So I went to graduate school. My dissertation research took me to northern Kenya, to northern Tanzania, um, also to a wildlife conservancy in central Kenya, where I still do research. And a lot of my research still today is focused in East Africa. Um, and then um, as I was finishing up graduate school, I got an opportunity to come work at the Natural History Museum in DC, where I work now to help put together a permanent exhibit on human evolution, which was amazing. And I knew nothing about how to build exhibits. And I know a little bit more now than I did before. Um, and so my job now is a combination of continuing to do my science research, but also helping to like lead education related to our exhibit and anything really that has to do with human evolution. So I'm gonna talk really just about my job as a science researcher. So what do I do? Um, so I do field work, both with fossils and modern bones. I'll tell you a little bit about my field work. Um, and so the field work with fossils is actually excavating fossils out of the ground. And the field work with modern bones is studying bones of animals that have recently died. Um, I also do 
museum collections work. So something you may not know is that oftentimes behind the doors of museums, so museums have amazing exhibits, but they also have tons and tons and tons of research collections. So I go back to some of those collections and restudy them with new tools and asking new questions and trying to find out new things that people have missed. So I do that in Africa, Europe, and the US. Um, and also I should add now soon in South America. Um, I also do some experiments with um, ancient stone tools or replica ancient stone tools and also with carnivores. So as a scientist, one of the things we do is like we manipulate a variable and we see what happens. And so even though I study the past, I can do that sometimes with my research where we will do things like butcher animal bones with stone tools. And what happens if there's a lot of meat when you start? And what happens if there's not a lot? What happens, this is a, a research that I did. What happens if the person who's doing the butchering is an expert? What happens if they have no idea what they're doing? Um, and what does that tell us about butchery in the past? I also, like other scientists, I write scientific papers that get published in science journals. Um, I write grant proposals. So I ask funding agencies to fund my research. Um, I do presentations about my science um, and posters at conferences. Um, and then for other people, I also review those scientific papers and grant proposals. And then sometimes I do interviews with journalists, with people writing in newspapers about new scientific studies. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about some of the research projects that I'm involved with now. Um, one of my longer term projects is at a site called Alorga Sile in Southern Kenya. Um, on the left, you can see me um, helping with the excavations where we actually are digging up fossils out of the ground, fossils between about half a million and a million years ago. I also spend a lot of time in the museum um, in Nairobi in Kenya. When we dig all the fossils out of the ground, we take them to the museum to study. So on the picture on the right, I'm, I'm surrounded by little bags full of fossils and I'm studying them. Um, I'm involved with a project in Romania where we're studying fossils that were excavated like 40 or 50 years ago, going back and looking at those fossils for traces of marks either left by ancient stone tools or marks left by carnivore teeth. So one of my big research questions is who ate what in the past? And I figure that out by figuring out who left marks on bones. I'm also studying in that same, um, with those same kinds of questions, actually a fossil collection now in a museum in Texas from a cave site in Texas that we think was a saber tooth den. So a lot of the same predators that are around today, like big cats, like lions and um, in Africa, that's things like cheetahs and leopards and hyenas as well. Um, but there are things that we can't study today that aren't because they're not around anymore because they went extinct and saber tooths are um, a big category of predators that were around when early humans were. So I'm studying fossils that were in this den that we think saber tooths basically chewed on. Um, I'm also, most of the time I study animals, but I'm also interested in studying who ate our ancestors. Um, so one project that I'm doing is looking at early human fossils to figure out who ate them. Um, and this summer I had a scientific paper published that made a lot of newspaper headlines because I didn't find what I expected to find. I thought I was gonna find predator tooth marks, but actually instead I found um, butchery marks left by stone tools by other early humans. So early humans eat other humans, maybe cannibalism in the fossil record and a pretty old example of it. Um, so sometimes you don't find what you're expecting to find, but sometimes that's really interesting. Um, I also am involved with a project, even though most of what I study is about ancient diets, I'm involved with a project that's documenting and analyzing, um, oops, that should say analysis, I spelled that wrong, um, footprints left by ancient modern humans um, kind of near a lakeshore in Tanzania. So trying to figure out like how many people were there and where were they going and what were they doing and um, I think our next step is actually going to be thinking about putting up sort of a museum building and display at the site to really preserve those fossil footprints um, for the future. And they're between about, I don't know, 6,000 and maybe 19,000 years old. So pretty cool, but like ancient versions of modern humans that are around today. Um, I think probably my longest term research project, though, is not looking at fossils, which might sound strange, but actually looking at modern bones in a wildlife conservancy, kind of like a national park in Kenya. Um, 
where I'm studying um, the ain't the whole bone community. So what animals have died, what predators have been chewing on them, what habitats are the animals dying in or the ones that eat grass like zebras actually dying in the grasslands and the ones that eat leaves like giraffes actually dying in the woodlands. And so that kind of information can help us understand past environments better. Um, so this is my field team out just walking straight lines, looking for modern bones, but also being very careful. You will see further in the back in that picture on the left, um, or at least somewhere back there is our armed guard. So we always have to go out with an armed guard because in a wildlife conservancy or a national park, and this one in particular, there's elephants, there's rhinos, there's lions, there's buffalo, there's lots of um, animals that could be really dangerous to us. Um, and so I've been doing this project for 20 years, actually. Um, I'm hoping to go back and do another round of field work this summer. And the last thing that I want to end with before I open it up to questions is to talk about one of my greatest fieldwork highlights. So the picture on the left, um, you may notice that I'm very pregnant. Um, so I have a 12 year old um, who's in sixth grade and um, he uh, came with me to the field before he was born um, because I really wanted to get a field season in before he was born because I know he'd be taking some time off. Um, and then when he was six, he actually came to the field with me. This is all at that Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya. Um, so he actually came with me to Kenya. We spent three weeks looking at fossils in the National Museum of Kenya, fossils from that site, Alorgasile. And then he came with me for a month um, to the Wildlife Conservancy. He wasn't able to come out to the field during the day. I wanted to make sure he was safe. And so, you know, hanging around and walking around with elephants and lions is probably not the best idea, but he was able to live with me and my research team out in the field. Um, and if you ask him about it, I think probably some of his most enduring memories are um, everybody making fun of me when we were when I was driving our vehicles around and trying to avoid elephants. Um, that, so I think he had a it was actually a really memorable experience that um, that he still enjoys talking about today. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to unshare my screen, um, but I'm really just wanted to give you more of a sense of kind of the different things that I do, and I would be very happy to, to take questions. All right, um, we have students that have questions and they can come on up. If you have, you wanna write them down while you're waiting. If you are uncomfortable sharing it, you can give it to someone who would like to ask it for you. All right, so just come on up. But uh, awesome. thank you very much. This was great, at least this part. Yes, it was awesome. <laughs> Um, hi. Um, hi. I was going uh, to ask, what's your favorite hominid? Like, oh, what's my favorite hominid? That's a great question. Um, so my favorite hominid is probably so, I, you know, there's a 20 plus species on our family tree. I would say my favorite hominin is probably Homo erectus. Um, which is sort of our grandparent species. We're Homo sapiens. Our ancestor species is probably one called Homo heidelbergensis. And the ancestor of that is probably Homo erectus. It's hard to know exactly who evolved into who in the fossil record. Um, but Homo erectus is my favorite because it's the first um, early human species, hominin species that probably started to eat a lot more be meat. Um, and that's the real focus of what I study, meat eating in the fossil record. It's also the first hominin to leave Africa and kind of venture to different parts of the world. So I sort of think of Homo erectus as, as like an intrepid traveler. And so maybe I feel some sort of kinship that way, I guess. Yeah. I mean, like it did discover fire, so it could probably cook like it, like animals and eat them. It so. Exactly. That's another thing. So the earliest evidence for cooking is probably with Homo erectus. That's, all right. So what's your favorite hominin? Probably like Kenyanthropus platyox, which is like. Oh, that's you. Cool. That's a pretty good knowledge of hominin. So why Kenyanthropus platyox? Um, I just think because it like it's like the only one they found at the time with like that specific genus. So, yep, it's the it's the only that's exactly it's the only species we know of that genus Kenyanthropus. So it's kind of uh, we don't know a lot about it. So maybe it's something you could work on in the future. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a question about the footprints. 
how yep. were they mm-hmm. preserved? Like, why weren't they washed away or, like, I yeah. don't know, destroyed? Well, somehow? That's an awesome question. Why were, how were those footprints preserved? Why weren't they washed away? Um, so the footprints, the layer that the footprints are in um, are basically cemented ash. So it's kind of like if you've ever seen a sidewalk being built, you, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing as concrete, but basically you have like wet material rolling around and then when it dries, it gets really hard. So the layer that the footprints is in is kind of like that. Um, it was, there was a volcano that's really close by to the footprints um, that spewed ash. And when the um, humans, the ancient humans were walking around on that you know, ground layer, they were basically, their footprints were in that wet ash. And then probably within a day or so, they, it dried and got really hard and cemented. Interestingly, though, one of the things our research teams is doing is um, using photogrammetry, like um, kind of high resolution photography, to measure how fast those footprints are eroding because they are eroding slowly. Um, And part of what we've done in our research is uncover a lot of them. Now, unfortunately, because we've uncovered them and brushed the sand off of them, they are slowly eroding um, at a rate of about one centimeter every hundred years. So... Um, That's why we're particularly now interested in how do we preserve them so that they don't disappear. What's the coolest animal you've ever seen? Oh, what's the coolest animal I've ever seen? Um, I mean, my favorite animals, I love lions. I'm, I'm like big on big predators, but I think some of the cooler animals I've ever seen, there is a really cool bird in East Africa called a secretary bird. It's not like ostrich tall, but it's pretty tall. Um, and they hunt snakes. And so I once saw one fly down, basically pick up a snake in its claw and just go like that and sort of uh, you know, kill the snake by like snapping it. And I don't know, it, it was a pretty, pretty cool bird. Um, so yeah, I would say, right. I don't know. You'd probably get a different answer if you asked me tomorrow, cause I've seen so many cool animals, but I think today my favorite one's a secretary bird. Nice. Hi, what is your favorite discovery that you have made? Oh, that's a good question. What's my favorite discovery? Um, Maybe so the the publication, the paper that I mentioned that got a lot of press this summer was about like maybe that earliest hominin or early human cannibalism. And it's one it's at least one of my favorite discoveries because um, it wasn't what I expected to find. And I think that's some of the most fun things in science is when you go in with sort of a hypothesis. I went in with a hypothesis that I was looking at all these early human fossils going, well, I think that after the evolution of Homo erectus, you're going to find less predation on the early humans. I found almost no predator tooth marks at all. So I, you know, was a little disappointed initially in in this study. And then I found these butchery marks. And, you know, next thing I know, there's like stories about it in the New York Times and the Washington Post. So um, because it was so surprising, I think it's, it's one of my favorite discoveries so far. All right. Thank you. Sure. What did you think, like, when you found the, like, human tools in the bones or the tools in the bones? Yes. So those tool marks, the ones in the bones, is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, so I was totally surprised. Um, it was, it really was not what I was expecting to find. And so there were other scientists that were in the museum during that time that were stu- that had the same kind of expertise that I do of looking at marks on bones. And I basically, because science is very much like, I don't do my science by myself. It's very much a collaborative process that you work with other people. So anybody who knew how to look at these marks, I went, come here, can you look at these? Am I crazy? Is this what I think they are? Um, And so it was because of my experience looking at so many fossil animal bones that had those stone tool butchery marks on them that I immediately recognized what they were. And also like the first time you saw like the big predators, like the rhinos and elephants, what did you think? Like, were you nervous at all? Absolutely. Mostly what I thought was, thank goodness I'm not, you know, that A, we have an expert armed guard with us and B, thank goodness that we're keeping a safe distance. So um, I still like, I love being in nature. I have a real awe of animals. Um, 
I do like it when I don't get too close to them, anything that is particularly dangerous. Um, but it's, you know, seeing animals like those really huge animals in their natural habitats to me is, is like just an amazing experience. Thank you. Sure. Have you ever uh, found a human bone while looking around on that, like the flat plane where you were looking for animal bones? Oh, good question. Have we ever found human bones in that conservancy? No, I haven't. That would be really surprising um, only because it's an area where there, there are a lot of people that live in there that work at the conservancy, but um, it would be surprising if there were human bones that nobody knew about. So I have not, but I have found bones of just about of lots of different kinds of animals, which is cool. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I've only heard of like like the like saber tooth, like tigers and like jungles and stuff. Like how did they get to like a cave in Texas? Yeah, it's a good question. So saber tooth um, cats, there's a couple different kinds or species or even genera, that's the plural of genus. Um, and they lived in all kinds of environments. They, some of them lived very much in, they're like sort of lived more in caves or lived more in cold areas of Europe and the ice ages. Um, and so the sort of cave or rock shelter in Texas, what the, at least the interpretation of people that study saber tooth behavior, as much as you can study the behavior of something that's extinct, we sort of base that on the closest living relative animals. They think that this was a place where the saber tooths were bringing back food as in like parts of animals to feed their young, to feed their babies. So it was sort of a safe place where maybe the, the babies were hanging out and that the parents were bringing food back to feed them. If you were looking for like fossils, like you were talking about um earlier, what would be like the most likely hominid you would like? What's the most likely species of hominid you would find? Oh, good question. So if I was looking for fossils, what's the most likely species? It depends on where and when. And so by when, I mean, when we're doing our research, we use obviously maps of like, where am I going and what am I looking for? But we also use geological maps, kind of maps of time. So like, are the sediments, you know, in this picture behind me, this is a picture from Olpegeta Conservancy, that wildlife conservancy in Kenya. But, you know, I could say like, is the dirt under that grass, are those sediments half a million years old? Are they a million years old? Are they three million years old? So depending on how old the sediments are, depends on how likely I am to find different hominins. As far as like the number of individual hominins that we have in all these different species, Homo sapiens we have the most of. Um, and so our species evolved about 300,000 years ago. Um, and one of the reasons that we have more Homo sapiens than any other species is one, because there have been more of us around. We think um, our populations are really high today. We think, you know, we had decently, our population slowly ramped up over the last couple tens of thousands of years, but also because we do something that is pretty unusual for other animals is we bury our dead, at least some cultures do. Um, and so the, the first step in becoming a fossil is being buried. Um, and so modern humans and, and our close evolutionary cousins that are now extinct Neanderthals, um, also buried their dead. And so we have more modern humans and Neanderthals than most of those other earlier species just because of that practice of burial. Where would you say the coolest place you've traveled for work is? Yeah, so I think Kenya is probably my favorite place. Um, and I really, I love the work that I do at the Wildlife Conservancy because it feels to me like I'm really in the middle of nature. I get to go somewhere that other people don't usually, well, there's a lot of tourists there, but I get to like walk around and go places that tourists don't get to go. Um, and I think also because I've been working there for 20 years, it feels kind of like a second home. Also because I've brought my son there, it sort of has a special place for me family-wise. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what was your, like, scariest moment slash, is, wait, person, human, is it exploration? Does it say exploration? Okay, yeah, what was your scariest moment slash exploration? 
Oh, uh, good question. So one of my scariest moments is I, I owned for a long time a, a big four wheel drive vehicle in Kenya it was my my car. It was a land cruiser that I could drive around. One of my scariest moments was actually driving through a river and my car stopped and I thought, is my car going to start again? Am I going to get out of this river? Thankfully, it was fine. And we were able to pull up the other bank. Um, of the river. So that was a little bit of a scary moment. I've had a couple of close encounters with some of those big animals. Um, we, uh, the guard that was with us a couple of years ago, uh, we got very close to buffalo, which kind of look like big cows, but they can be really crabby and aggressive. Um, and so he actually had to fire his gun in the air to sort of scare off a buffalo um, that was sleeping and we just kind of stumbled on it. Um, and once, um, a long time ago, I was working in another wildlife conservancy or driving through another wildlife conservancy and, um, sort of came across two elephants fighting. Um, and also that was a very close encounter that was a little scary. So thankfully I'm like, I try to be really safe. Um, but wild animals can be unpredictable. Okay. Um, do you have any hypotheses about um, humans eating each other? Oh, good question. Do I have any hypotheses? My, my, so my hypothesis about how I interpreted that evidence that I found that I published on this summer, it was just one leg bone of an early human with some butchery, stone tool butchery marks on it. The hypothesis for that was, I think they were probably just people who were very hungry. Um, so we didn't see evidence that there was like some like particular with one bone, you can't see a pattern of something like, are they treating dead people in a certain way? So sometimes cannibalism is a part of like honoring the dead and a cultural practice and a way of, of you know, showing honor to your ancestors. Sometimes in other groups, it's done as an act of aggression, like you're in warfare and you're eating your enemies. Um, so for the earliest examples of this, though, I really think it's what's called nutritional cannibalism. It's just people are starving um, and um they're eating other people after they died just to keep themselves going. Thank you. Since you have like the armed guards, what kind of weapons do they hold? Yeah, so they hold rifles usually. Um, and they are like, they're trained by the military in Kenya. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but they 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 have real bullets and everything in them. So, but like, thankfully, they've we've never had to have um, any. They've never had to do anything except fire warning shots when I've been out doing field work. I believe we have a couple questions in the chat as well. Oh yes, thank you. Let me check out the chat. Thanks. Um, okay, so how can I tell what mark on a bone was made from? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, at what a mark on a bone was made from. So I do this based on um, doing experiments and studies like in the in the modern world and then applying what I find to the fossils. So I do experiments where we, where I use replica. I'm like looking over here to see if I have a good replica stone tool with me on my desk. Um, I don't think I do, although I have one around the corner. But so if I, I can do experiments where I basically like make marks on modern bones. You might be able to see them here. Um, use stone tools, make marks on modern bones, and then look at the shape of those marks. Um, I also have right outside my office in the museum, a big collection of bones chewed on by predators in Africa. So part of what I did in that wildlife conservancy was basically follow predators around and pick up their leftovers. So studying the chewing damage on the marks left by things like lions and cheetahs and um, hyenas, and then also making those marks with stone tools, I can really start to differentiate the kind of the size and the shape of those marks. Um, and so it's really like looking at the marks that I know what made them and then being able to find those patterns in, in fossils. And then what's the coolest fossil that I've ever found? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I have not found an early human fossil myself. Um, you know, some of the coolest fossils that I found, although it's not directly related to my research, when I was doing my PhD or my dissertation research and excavating um, at that site, Old Divide Gorge in Tanzania. And we were excavating what was an, like an ancient lake. So it was very sort of quiet, um, 
water probably and the fossils were really well preserved and there were beautiful fossils of hippos so there were like fossils of hippo bones and fossils of hippo teeth and they were all kind of light pink and i don't know why they were pink well uh, they were pink because it, the color of any fossil comes from the minerals in the dirt that it was buried in that sort of get um uh, leached into those fossils so um those fossils were to me beautiful. They were beautifully preserved. They were just, they were, they were really stunning. Um, what's the best part of my job? I think the best, there's a lot of good parts of my job. Um, I think the best part of my job in some ways is like, I get to come up with research questions and then I get to go figure out how to answer them. And then I get to go do that research. So like I get it's it, to me, it feels really creative. I get to, um, basically kind of, you know, ask my own questions and, and work with other people to answer them. Um, doing research is, is probably some of the best parts of my job. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes we don't find what we think what we're going to find. But overall, even when, so certainly when I'm pulling fossils out of the ground and excavating, and I can think like, okay, nobody has seen this fossil for a million and a half years. Like I'm the first person to see this. I might be able to find those butchery marks that tells me that right here, an early human actually butchered this animal. That's amazing to me. That's like, it's like reaching through time and like actually, you know, grasping evidence. Um, and the thing is that even when I do the studies in museum collections, I'm able to like, I open a bag and I'm like, I might find butchery marks on these bones that nobody has seen before. So it's, it's the like being able to make discoveries, you know, every time I do research, it is really exciting. Yeah. How often do I find something? I, I sometimes joke, like sometimes we dig very big empty holes. Um, and so not every excavation, um, it, we're going to find anything. I did an excavation in Indonesia um, in which we found almost nothing. Um, I also did an excavation in Kenya at one point in which we found literally nothing. Um, doesn't happen that often because um, most of the time we excavate in places where we think there's a good chance we're going to find fossils based on how old the dirt or the sediment is. And also, a lot of times archaeologists go back to places where people have worked before. So those scientific papers are really important because they let us know, oh, this team worked here and this is what they found and maybe we'll pick up where they left off. What's the most dangerous thing I've seen while excavating? So when I, I excavated in a wildlife conservancy, not that one that I work in now, but in um, actually a national park, Savo National Park in Kenya. Um, and we were excavating what was supposed to be called the man-eater's den. So when the railroad was being built from the coast of Kenya all the way inland, um, more than a hundred years ago, there were um, people that were building the railroad um, had, there were like, there's actually a movie made about it called The Ghost in the Darkness. Um, th there were tales of these two lions that were like, you know, hunting humans and all of this stuff. And so what, there was a British army colonel who had taken a photo of, oh, there's this place where they're bringing back skeletons and like eating people. And so um, we were excavating that man eater's den. That's the big hole I dug that we found nothing um, because it turned out that probably if anything was there, it would have been washed away. Um, but while we were doing that excavation, this enormous and incredibly quiet elephant basically just kind of walked around us while we were doing this excavation. Didn't hear a thing, you know, it was only we had somebody from the Kenya Wildlife Service, also an armed guard with us, but um, that's probably the most dangerous thing I've seen while excavating. Um, and it's amazing how a six ton animal can be silent. Oh, so what do I think or know about Homo floresiensis? So this is a cool species that um, was found in 2004, really surprising, only known from one island in Indonesia, the island of Flores. Um, and they're relatively recent. We know them from the past like 100,000 to maybe 50,000 years ago. But through human evolution, most um, species have evolved larger and larger body sizes, but Homo floresiensis is pretty recent and really short and really small. Um, and so actually one of my, a postdoctoral fellow, so someone who finished their PhD to this doing research here is actually studying what Homo floresiensis ate. Um, and she's writing up a scientific paper right now based on um, did Homo floresiensis, um, the other things that were found with that um, 
or with Homo floresiensis are things like really giant storks and really giant rats, but really tiny elephants or stegodon. Um, so there's big questions about whether they ate stegodon. And also she has studied thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of little rat bones. So were the rats in that same excavation because Homo floresiensis was eating them? Um, you will find out when she submits her paper, hopefully within the next couple of months. So. Oh, what do I know about Australopithecus garhi? You guys are great with the hominin species names. So there's only one fossil known of Australopithecus garhi, um, and we only have a skull of it. So we don't really know what the rest of the body looked like. Um, there are some questions about whether that skull might actually fit into other species. So I would say even collectively as scientists, we know not a lot. They're dated to, I think, about two and a half million years old when there's a couple other species around. I don't think we know a ton about it at this point. Maybe we'll find more things that scientists call Australopithecus garhi, but for now it's kind of pretty mysterious. I think we got one more question coming in. Great. Now, now you're getting all of the hominid uh, check-ins. Excellent, right. All the, what's your favorite species? Well, they've all been listening to the uh, the Mr. Nikki, and so they're obsessed with uh, singing about hominids all the time. Nice. Oh, how oh, important was Homo heidelbergensis? That's a great question. Oh, so nice. like, <laughs> so like I said, um, we probably Homo heidelbergensis was our ancestor species and it was probably a common ancestor that we shared with Neanderthals. Um, interestingly, the people that study, so Homo floresiensis, is, uh, sorry, Homo heidelbergensis is known from maybe about 700,000 years ago to about 200,000 years ago. It's like a half million year period in what we call the middle Pleistocene. Um, there's questions about, so, and it's also known from um, Africa as well as from Europe. There are questions about, is it all the same species? Should they be lumped together? Should there be separate species? Um, there are, are people that jokingly call this the muddle in the middle, like all the like all this stuff in the middle Pleistocene that we still like maybe we have it teased apart. Maybe there are more than one species in there. Um, so I think it was probably quite important, at least as far as understanding sort of the last million years of human evolutionary history. And what was the most common diet of hominins? I would say. Uh, everything. Um, so really what I study is ancient diets. And so pretty much all hominins ate whatever they could that was around them. Um, we know that there were some additions to the diet. So like starting maybe three, three and a half, two and a half million years ago, we start to see butchery of animals. Probably meat was being eaten before then, but maybe meat from small animals and lizards and birds and stuff where you wouldn't actually find a lot of the traces of that. Um, and then we know that maybe a million years ago, people started cooking. So, but really all of that, it's been a big, like a push towards expanding the diet. Probably insects were there all along. Um, so the most common diet was everything, which doesn't sound like a great answer, but I think it's, it's really pretty accurate. Um, and so why do we study this? I don't know if that's a, that's related to diets or human evolution in general, but you know, I would say as far as human evolution in general, it's kind of understanding where people came from helps us potentially understand like what our past history is or prehistory, what constrains where our evolution might go. Um, as far as diets go in general, um, I think like what anything eats is a huge part of what that animal or organism is and how it's adapted. And so like understanding diets really help us understand the rest of lifestyles and, and behaviors of early human. So why did meat or large amounts of it only start to be eaten 3 million years ago? Good question. It's possibly because, um, so, um, Early hominins had, some of them had bigger teeth than ours, but um, they didn't have sharp teeth like predators do today. So they couldn't, even our earliest ancestors really couldn't bite into the skins of animals to be able to eat them. So it was only with the... Um, the origin of, st of making stone tools that people had sharp edges to be able to actually cut into the skins and be able to cut up carcasses. So probably there's a relationship between tool making and more meat eating. 
think we're out of questions. Um, we'll keep you on just so you can say hi to the students a little bit more, but um, just for the sake of the recording, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Povenar. You're welcome. Um, and let's turn it These off. These are great questions. And I think you are, this class has asked me the most about specific hominin names um, than of any other class that I've ever talked with. So kudos to all of you who are really studying the human family tree. <laughs>